Yeah, I mean, I think if you're going to do this job, you've got to have some sort of pride about what you do. Sometimes I'm here probably too much, you know what I mean? Seven days a week sometimes, especially moving the lights. They have to be moved. Even if there's no game, you still have to come to make sure the lights are okay and move them off there, you know, where they're standing. My name's Dave Butler, QPR Stadium head groundsman. I um, started working for a company called Sports Turf, who maintained the stadium pitch, um, but I was going around doing specialised work at other grounds, um, verti draining, hollow coring, overseeding, stadiums like Tottenham, Wembley, all the top clubs, well not all the top clubs, but many of them, especially in the London area. Then what happened was the training ground at Twyford, um, Ray Wilkins was trying to get it to a bit, bit, bit of a better standard, and he asked us if we could go in and take over. So I got that role of looking after QPR part of Twyford Avenue, the old training ground. Then in about two th year 2000, year 2001, two, I was sort of promoted to contracts manager and asked to come down to the stadium and take over the responsibilities of the stadium. Um, obviously that involved just the tail end of the rugby with Wasp playing here and Fulham mainly. So we had two teams playing here. And basically I've sort of worked here ever since. Recently the club have looked to upgrade everything, the facilities, especially at the training ground. I was looking to go more of an in-house team um, no disputes with sports turf, but we all sat around the table, had a discussion, and it was agreed that I'd come over and work for QPR full time as the head groundsman. To get the finished product uh, of the pitch, when it's all nicely striped up and it's all neatly marked out, etc., uh, there's a huge amount of uh, pride actually in that. Hello, my name's Malcolm Gardner. I'm the grounds manager here at uh, the Heston Training Ground for Queen's Park Rangers Football Club. I mean, I've been on this site really for uh, around about 17 years, uh, originally with British Airways. Um, progressed uh, through to Imperial College, who owned it after British Airways. And, and I've been on the site really since uh, Queen's Park Ranger have owned the site actually, and uh, they bought it from um, Imperial College. A lot of the work actually uh, was to do with, um, there was a few meetings, um, and also overseeing the, the construction work uh, as it progressed and as it started up. Um, most of the pitches actually uh, that we plan to have here uh, will all be hybrid grass pitches um, and uh, with a deso stitched uh, top, each costing around about a uh, million pound uh, each. So uh, the level of investment that went into uh, these pitches, we've got five so far. Uh, we're expecting to build uh, another two over the next year or two uh, and then followed closely by a indoor uh, 3G pitch and an outdoor 3G pitch. The difference actually between the sort of pitches that we've been managing here actually under British Airways and Imperial College, uh, which are saw based pitches, is very much a different level when it comes to uh, looking after a professional football pitch with the Dessos. Uh, there's a lot more work involved, a lot more uh, a lot more uh, preparation of the surfaces. Uh, the key to success with those sort of pitches is to make sure that the surfaces are kept absolutely clean. Uh, so we do a lot of hand cutting where the grass is removed actually from the surface. So we don't let that fly. Um, what we are after actually is for uh, the, if it rains, um, the pitches can be played on actually because the rain actually just passes through quite quickly the surface. Yeah well it's unbelievable um, I mean I have to say QPR were probably one of the reasons most of the pitches in the country or the top pitches are now deso fibres because QPR were looking for a surface that was wanted to come down and they were looking for a surface that could take football and rugby um, so trips were made with the manager and the club to um, Holland, I believe it was, to investigate and it was decided to have a Deso pitch. I think we was first or second in the country. Um, obviously that was a reasonable success. The grass still grows, but the, goes, but the surface stays stable with the Deso. Um, so they sort of led the way really. And now, like I say, most of the Prem is uh, Deso pitches or some, some sort of hybrid of it. Um, so there's carpets, there's different, different types of injected um, fibres, but QPR were the leading light in that, I believe. But there are more demands, I would say. One stadium problem is the light, which we have a big problem with here, especially in the winter. Over two thirds of the pitch is in darkness for two or three months, and it's obviously it's difficult to grow grass in 
the dark. We're trying to utilise lighting rigs, which are a new thing out, but we're limited on access and storage. But we're always looking to, we, we sort of upped our lights this year. We're going to be looking to do so in the future, um, but it is jugg juggling where we can put them and the access problem. A saw-based pitch, uh, you could probably, with good maintenance, uh, uh, you could probably get tr training on them for about three hours. Uh, a Desso pitch uh, with the correct type of um, maintenance, um, they can be uh, anything up to 20 hours. That's of course 20 hours actually that I can't get on the pitch and maintain them. So you know, I try and reel that back a little bit and try and be a bit, a bit realistic, but um, probably as a, as a rule of thumb actually that uh, they're being used uh, roughly around about 15 hours a week. And of course, with that level of uh, usage, of course, that means increased uh, maintenance as well. Other things, there's more warm-ups. There seems to be more players these, this, these days um, with the extra subs. And even if the ones don't want to play, they want to do some sort of activity after the game. So it's before or after, half-time. You've got mascots coming out. There's so much more activity to, to try and manage and. From, from the old days, you know, when everyone was trying to keep off it because the pitches were so poor. Yeah, it's basically sort of trying to quarantine, some sort of quarantine for the pitch. You could be bringing things in off your shoes. You might have filled your car up with petrol at the garage. You've got some petrol on your shoe. You, nobody knows what they, people are carrying around on their feet. Footfall, every time you're pushing your, the grass down, especially in the winter with the frost. We had some problems with the foxes um, a few weeks ago where they were dancing around on the frost. It's all all goes black. In fact, if someone walked across it, I could probably get their shoe. It's how I defined the black mark is and, and identify who it was if I had a load of shoes. I, I'm That's not going to ask what you do with that shoe. <laughs> At the beginning of the year, uh, we, we started out with two, uh, two grand staff, which was myself and Tom. We've steadily grown the team. Uh, it has been a little bit difficult with the current climate, uh, but we've steadily uh, grown the team and we're now up to uh, eight in total. And that has sort of produced that rapid growth actually, trying to, to get the team to, to bond quite well, um, can throw its challenges a little bit. Uh, it's getting to know uh, each of the individuals um, uh, and what their, uh, what their specialties are, etc. And, and trying to mould them into a team has been um, quite good. And I think um, certainly for the short team, the time that the team have been together, uh, it's moulded very well. And I think they're, they're, they're working superbly together. Teamwork actually is, is key really, I think, to, to the success actually of everything that we do here. You must have some fascinating stories about different requirements from different managers. Well, I'd have to be very diplomatic, diplomatic on that front. There were some requests that were a bit strange. Um, I had one manager say, don't make it too good this week. They'll play us off the park. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that was a bit of a tricky one. I wasn't quite sure how to make it worse. You know what I mean? How to make it bad. You just have to deal. Everyone's got their own little sort of idiosyncrasies. Depends on the results. If you're doing well, no one ever, you know, everyone's happy. As soon as the results start going against you, everyone's sort of looking for a reason. Sometimes the pitch takes the blame, sometimes rightly so, do you know what I mean? But yeah, I can't really sort of I'll divulge too much without dropping names and... <laughs> to maintain the pitches after a training match, what have you, uh, we, we can get on there um, literally with two or three guys uh, with hand mowers um, and it's done very quickly. And, and that is the key really actually, is, is the speed at which we can do, uh, we can actually uh, maintain the pitches. Well, we've got some discussions going on at the moment about um, relaying the pitch. It's reached its end of its lifespan, which was 10 years. Um, it shouldn't need to go all the way down. The underground heating should be fine, but we'll take the top off, put the loan back on, redesso, restitch, or, or whatever fibre we decide to put in. Maybe tweak the sprinklers a, a bit to get them a bit more up to date, and maybe the track as well. But that's all ongoing discussions, hopefully, for this end of this season. Over time, the deso is supposed to be sort of 20 mil proud, but some of it in ours is 30, 35 mil proud. So that means eventually that's going to pull out and then you're playing on sand. Basically, a deso pitch is sort of mostly sand, but if obviously if you played on that, it would be 
so soft, you can imagine like playing on the beach. So they punch fibres in. I think it's 20 million of them. 20 centimetres down, two centimetres proud. And that holds everything together. And over time, where well, you're cleaning the surface every year, the deso starts to become more proud. So obviously then that's the end of its life and you have to start again. I think uh, with a project this size, uh, I think there is there's always room for improvement. Um, whilst you know we have superb facilities and uh, the difference between uh, the facilities that we we have available at the moment uh, compared to over a year ago, uh, it's, um, it is growing and yeah I think actually it's uh, it's a good. Um... Yeah, you definitely got to have some sort of pride in what you do. Can be a bit demoralising sometimes. You know, when we had to have training, we had to facilitate the training a few weeks ago because of the cold temperatures. And you're sort of pulling your hair out, which isn't very good for me, but you know, but you've got to facilitate, you know, the players need to train. So, but all your hard work, you're thinking, Brian, I've been doing this for two weeks, like seeding over seeding, getting it just right. And then you're, uh, <laughs> but you've got to do what you've got to do. To know that, uh, you know, the team are coming out and, and playing on your surfaces is, is you know, sort of top. Uh, uh, a top thing to do to have. The thing is, with um, with uh, that sort of surface, um, quite often what you see on the surface is um, is pretty much uh, probably about five percent of everything actually that goes on within the soil and the preparation and the, the looking after the pitches compared to um, hybrid pitches. Um, again, looking after the soil as well as the grass actually is, is quite uh, normal.